Hello, I'm Julia Rodriguez Elliott, producing artistic director. Welcome to Fridays at Five Eye on Design. We have a, a terrific panel uh, today, and we're uh, really anxious to get started. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral territory of the Gabrielino Tongva tribe, and we are grateful for their stewardship of the land. As always during our conversation, if you wanna ask any questions, please feel free to post them on the chat and we'll get to as many as we can during the conversation and, uh, and after the conversation. So uh, ask your questions as, uh, as we move through the program. And now I, it is my pleasure to introduce four outstanding artists. They are all a Noise Within resident artist. And I will start by introducing Angela Kalin. Hi. And Angela is both a costume designer and a scenic designer. Frederica Nascimento. Hello. Fre Frederica is a scenic designer. Great to be here. Ken Booth. Hello. Ken Booth is a lighting designer. And finally, Robert Oriel, who is a composer. Hello. And also a sound designer. Welcome, everyone. So glad to have you, have you here. We don't often get to talk to our, our designers, so I'm really excited uh, to be having this, this, this conversation with, with all of you. So I'll start with that question that everybody hates, because it's sort of like asking you what, who, you know, what your favorite child is. But before I do that, why don't you give us a little bit of... Um, of background and tell us, you know, how many shows you, you've done at A Noise Within and if you can remember that far back, how long you've been a, a resident artist. Angela, what, why don't we start with you? Hi, so um, I barely can remember the, the mm -hmm. time when I started. It's been 1994. My first show was King Lear in the old Masonic Temple. And uh, I did over 50 productions, 61 to be exact. 61, <laughs> wow, wow, yes. terrific. Yes. Um, yeah. Ken, yes. what, about, what about you, Ken? Well, I've been with the company since 1998. The first production was um, Berry Child. And, um, and then I followed the, that the with- The first uh, Berry Child. The first one, yes, and followed that um with the seagull so i did those two in rep right off the bat and um i was asked to be an ra um in 99 and i know that i've designed over 60 productions i'm not sure the exact count wow frederica um i have been with a noise within i'm the new kid on the block mm -hmm. i believe uh, since 2014 and uh, I haven't counted maybe more or less between 12 15 productions already uh, just for an us within so yeah you've been, been very very yeah. busy since you started <laughs> yes it has been a great great experience and uh, really thrilling to to be able to design at an us within and being a resident artist too. Great, Robert, what about you? Well, I was counting 21 shows, but I forgot that I had done one in the old space in 2007, I did As You Like It, so 22 total. Um, 16 of those were full scores, four were musicals and I was in the pit and two were just sound design. Wow. And I've been All a resident have... artist since 2015. Wow, terrific. All of you have a really lo long history with the theater and we're, we're really, really lucky to, to have you. So now that the dreaded question, uh, what, what is your favorite production? Tell us a little bit about what, the, what your favorite production is and why. And you know, you don't have to limit it to just, just one. You can maybe give us a top five, but maybe choose one and talk about why that uh, makes the list as, 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 a, as a top five production. Frederica, you want to start us out? Sure. Um, I, I have to go with five because it's really <laughs> impossible to just focus on one. Um, 
So I would start uh, with uh, Harry V, uh, Argonautica, Alice in Wonderland, um, Julius Caesar. And uh, just because it was my first one and I have incredible stories about it, and you were directing Tartuffe uh, by Moliere, which was my first production um, in the house. And also, I believe we were all there um, yeah. for Tartuffe. So it was like really, uh, you can't get better for a first experience. Wow. Oh gosh, look at that set. That was a that, that was beautiful. Beautiful set. Is there is there a, 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 Frederica it was your first production with the theater and designing in the thrust stage. Is there something else that jumps out at you in terms of uh Tartuffe really being a one of your favorite productions? Um well, first of all, I I love Moliere mm -hmm. and uh, and also what was really amazing to me was that um, I found a director, uh, being you, Julia, that was fearless. And you were ready to welcome um, ideas of space and interaction and painting. And so um, it was really magnificent for me to introduce um, all these sort of abstract language within um, um, a classical repertory company work. And, um, and for me, it was super interesting to work on, um, you know, like to be able to um, put that tower, that red tower stage left for Tartuffe to sneak in between the walls and that um, monumental um, trap, um, jail-like uh, fly-in uh, cutout um, and combine all of that uh, on the thrust stage, uh, which is a, a challenge also being in repertory at the same time. So it was just like this out of the world unique experience because I was sharing also a stage. Um, and um, also it was like uh, one of the most beautiful floors um, that I remember. Yeah, but the floors for those of you that, you know, that, that experience the theater are, are a huge scenic element in our space. It's really not so much when you're in a proscenium theater, but with a three quarter sta um, stage and have an audience on all three sides, the floor becomes a huge scenic element. So I know that you as designers have a lot of conversations around floors and color of floor and lighting for that. But yes, Frederica, I, I love the way that you use architecture in Tartuffe. It was a really a, a beautiful production. Um, Angela, yeah. what about you? <laughs> um, I will start with the last one with Alice. It's truly one of my favorites. And it, another of my favorites is actually my all time favorite. It's Three Penny Opera. And I, I was lucky enough to be able to do it twice. And I think the second time we nailed it. Um, Gem of the Ocean definitely stands out as a, an exceptional production and unique for as far as I'm concerned. Um, um, what Paris was it? Talk, Angela, because yeah. I, I, lo I love the clothing and, and Gem of the Ocean. Talk a little bit about that. There was so much history in the way mm -hmm. that you designed that show and particularly the character of Aunt Esther and such. Would you, it, would you talk a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah, it was a very special, for me, it, it was a very special experience because it's a world that I'm not very familiar with. Um, and I had a, a, a chance to research um, and find some amazing uh, existing costumes, meaning not even costumes, they're clothes. Um, for this particular production for Aunt Esther, I, I was very fortunate by accident to, to um, stumble upon, upon a very interesting Namibian traditional clothing. Um, the Herrero women dress in 
very in a very similar fashion and it is absolutely stunning if anybody is interested in uh, in um, seeing more images of these women are just just uh, uh, google herrero traditional clothing in namibia it's phenomenal and also of course to work on on an august wilson play is just amazing on such a heartbreaking and uh, um, poetic and magical play was just a treat. I, I wanted, I was hoping one day to be able to design um, a show like this. And I was very fortunate that uh, Greg Daniel um, uh, accepted me in, <laughs> I mean, not accepted, but uh, uh, had me design the costumes for, for, for his show. And of course, having both ladies, these fantastic um, female characters that this play has, both of them are just amazing. And to work with two resident artists was even, even more of a treat. So it was a truly remarkable experience. I was very happy with it. And I, I was very happy with the way the costumes turned out. They really told a story. It was really quite mm -hmm. beautiful. Ken, what about you? Well, that's as hard as trying to pick your favorite, five favorite albums to take with you to the desert <laughs> island. But um, I want to start with a few shows from the Glendale location. Mm -hmm. um, the Chairs, uh, Taming of the Shrew, A Wild Holiday, and then um, Imagine at the New Space, Imaginary and Invalid and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And my reason for choosing those shows is not so much like being, you know, like so much of the design element. I mean, I was happy with the design elements and all of them, but, but just like, I, I think about a lot of those shows long after they're gone, as if I had been a spectator and had just watched it, you know, without being part of it. So it's just a fondness for the, the actual show. And with Rosencrantz and Yodestern, I mean, I was, more than happy with the, the end result with the um, the set design, lighting design, costumes, and and um, uh, what else? What did I leave out? Sound, lights, costumes, set. set. Um, I love the uh, I love the symmetry of the lighting and the symmetry of the set together, um, and you know. I had a little bit of angst going into this show, like when I started thinking about it, kind of, um, but then I would think about the chairs, which was unique that in the same way that trying to follow the action of the actors without anybody really noticing the subtle changes of, of lighting. I mean, sometimes you have the lights, you know, all on, but then you try to isolate certain areas of the thrust stage as best as possible without the audience really noticing. I, I loved how we used the scrim. I mean, it was a really simple device, but I just loved the look of a scrim against um, a psych. And we had some light trees in the back. And um, uh, yeah, so again, just having angst and trying to follow the actors around slowly because you have two actors who are just constantly moving around the stage, but don't want to just keep the lights on all the time. You know, you try to, you try to create like these subtle internal cues just to, just to help with the action. Beautiful. Robert, you're up. <laughs> ah, favorites. Yeah. You know, usually really, if a show is a favorite, it depends on how it ended. To me. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I, I loved Tartuffe. Tartuffe had two of the, my favorite things in the world, classical guitars and pipe organs. And who doesn't love a show with classical guitars and pipe organs? And Frederica's set was absolutely stunning in that. Um, but I guess I got to go with Invalid, Imaginary Invalid, because of the way that that one ended. And that one ended like no no other play we've we've put on yet. That was a weird weird show. 
In a good way. Um, yeah. Everything about it was weird. The Raphael. I mean, you know, if you've seen the show and you've seen Raphael in that show, you know, it was a weird show and Raphael was very weird in it. So the music had to be weird too, but also that was one of the shows where I got to write music to existing lyrics that somebody else had written. The music, or the words came with the show and I got to put my own music under them and that's always fun. And then having the cast come into my studio back when that was a thing you could do and uh, have them record their vocals. We didn't have a musical director, so that's how they learned their parts. They came over, I worked with them, they recorded them and they left with a copy of them singing the song properly so they knew it could be done. Um, but by the end of the day, I had a track with everybody's vocals on it, the full cast laid out. And at that point, I could tell that the song was really going to work. So that was fun for me in that regard. That's what I liked about Imaginary Invalid. Do we have a little sample of that by chance? We might. Um... My dearest daughter's marrying a doctor. No more care by Proctor. Now we'll have one in the family. And every melody will be dealt with instantly. He may be short, he may be tall, but he will always be on call. This is the worst day of my life. I'm to become a dullard's wife. I never thought I'd see the day when my papa gave me away to anyone without my say and to some dolt I've never seen. It's unforgivable and mean. And now I've met a man who's standing very near. I can't reveal my feelings because I have this fear. That were I to tell him now, he'd run like a deer. And yet I wish that both of us could meet again. Yes, any place but here. I love that. I love that. And and that was a collaboration. Both a Angela designed sets and, and costumes for that. Uh, Robert did music and, and, and Ken did lights for that production. Uh, let's talk a little bit about process. So what does it look like for each of you from the moment that you first read the play till you get to a final uh, design? Um, Frederica, will you will you talk a little bit a little bit about that? What your what process you follow? Um, sure. Um, I believe that uh, I am truly inspired by collaboration with a director when um, after I read a text and um, and when I start um, creating the world that the director shares with me. I always love to ask the directors, as you know, Julia, like, tell me the story. What is the story that they're gonna tell? And, um, and that's really the beginning of my process. And when I go to my first design uh, meeting, I bring nothing with me but that reading, that first reading, sometimes more than one time. Uh, and um, after that, um, being an architect um, also informed my work um, in, um, in a special way. So I'm always trying to be um, a visual storyteller. Um, that and so when uh, some of the images that we're looking at here are from um, our production of Henry V. So I'm just going to jump in for a minute, Frederica, mm -hmm. and just uh, for you to talk about after that initial meeting, um, most you put together what I like to call inspiration books, which are generally images that you found that seem to connect to the world to the world of the play um, that you're beginning to uh, to discuss with a with uh, the director. And so you create all these seemingly random images, like the ones that we're looking at, at now for Henry V, and, and that really becomes part of that process, doesn't it? True. Um, 
what happens is these images that we're looking at uh, now, uh, they are actually uh, from the probably our last folder because we always start with, uh, and I am not exaggerating if I talk about 50, 100 images of the world that um, the director at that point and myself are trying to bring uh, to stage. And so um, my research goes from painting, architecture, uh, photography, anything I can get my hands on. And um, what is very important to me and uh, being uh, at the noise within is that uh, we are working in a thrust uh, space, uh, thrust stage. And so again, the architecture of um, the theater uh, really informs me uh, as a scenic designer. And so as uh, you all know, I am uh, ultimately a um, uh, model maker, designer. Um, and when I start sketching um, after the research, um, my sketching um, becomes part of my process um, to find that new way of telling a classic story um, and uh, in the hope of um, uh, making um, this new way of storytelling appear on stage. And, uh, and it becomes very sculptural because I'm completely hands-on model making and I tend to uh, sketch uh, and sculpt uh, and uh, ultimately uh, creating fictional ephemeral architecture uh, where the, the stage is very important. So my models look like my sets all the time. <laughs> yes, they I do. Always, I always keep telling um, uh, everyone, especially uh, Sam Sintaf, and that I need to mention because she has been like incredible, uh, also building uh, my sets and. Uh, and I believe for every fifth, I was so lucky to have sets to go. Um, um, and Mark was uh, building uh, these huge monumental structures. Um, that, and, uh, it's, and it's really interesting, Frederica, because when I think back to, to all the, 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 the books that you put together, you know, we've collaborated on a lot of productions that, you know, as you amass all this research and all these photographs, and then eventually you end up zeroing in on two or three image. And those two or three images end up really informing the design. Um, in, in such a significant way. And I, and I think about, you know, I can think about three things with Henry. I think about that cross. I think about that image that we were very taken by where there were all these bodies on sort of like um, on, on, on that step unit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then some of the architectural lighting that you brought in that became such a central part of, uh, of that production. Mm -hmm. so, and I, um, I have to mention, um, uh, can in this production because, uh, and of course, music and costumes, but Can was um, really uh, with me uh, on bringing this light that was already inside these monumental uh, amphitheaters like uh, we were looking for. Uh, because that was the, our idea to have the theater within the theater and, uh, and bring monumentality to, to the design and the crosses and swords and power and religion. And, and I can't believe that since the first um, introduction uh, with the actors when we were uh, during our first rehearsal um, introduction where designers um, come forward and talk about what we have been doing before uh, they start working. 
and I was thrilled to see everybody excited about it. And I also need to mention Raphael because he <laughs> was just the perfect airy fifth. And he was flying over those gigantic step units and all actors. Uh, yes, it, it, it was a very exciting space for absolutely for 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 a director and for the actors to to play in. Mm -hmm. And and usually it's fair to say that usually you start with the scenic design and and then you begin introducing costumes designer into the process and and the lighting designer. But in general, I think it's fair to say that usually the scenic design le uh, leads because both the director and the scenic designer are trying to figure out what the what the world of the play is and what what kind of a, an environment uh, the play lives in. You know, every now and then I think that a that a designer is has a unique opportunity to design both costumes and set. And so Angela, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that because I believe for instance that you design sets and costumes for Imaginary Invalid that we've been talking a little bit about. Yeah. So will you talk about your process there? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the the uh, set, the scenic design process, it's very similar. And actually the uh, costume design process, it's very similar to what Frederica mentioned. It, in a sense, it's it's about the same, the same steps, more or less. Um, reading the play, then meeting with you, having this uh, initial conversation and then um, moving on to uh, doing research. And uh, that's true for both the set and the costume process. Um, I will probably talk a little bit more about the uh, physical process of getting from the reading all the way to the, let's say, opening night. Um, and for me, designing both the sets and the costumes, obviously you have to be extremely flexible to get to, to uh, be a good communicator for both the sets and the costumes. So you have to deal, and if something doesn't go well, you can only blame yourself for it. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, so we start with the uh, reading, with the initial meeting, uh, with the research and uh, just as um, Frederica mentioned, I do use a variety of uh, su just surfing the net, uh, looking for images of any sort, photography, uh, installation art, uh, fashion design, cost, uh, co the history of costume, um, anything that would create the would give me the the initial grasp on the uh, telling of the story in a way and uh, from that from there uh, we keep having these meetings um, quite a few of them that the whole process takes about at least three two three months from start to finish at least um, once I have the idea of what direction we're going to, I start doing the working on um, for the costumes on sketches, of course, black and white initially, a lot of them. So we go through quite a few um, options, variants on of of the what will end up being the final design uh, for the set. Um, Obviously, the the uh, model is very helpful. The white model. I am not a tremendously uh, detail oriented uh, model maker, but I think it's serviceable enough. So when the final product is ready, that the um, um, whomever builds the set will have a good idea. Um, from this moment on, we move on to the finalized renderings for costumes, which include colors and uh, the final colored model and uh, paint elevations for um, the, the scenic, um, sh the scene shop. And 
um, once usually once rehearsal starts, that's when the costumes come together, and uh, same with obviously with the um, set. And of course, this is the time to mention a couple of people who are absolutely amazing and without whom imagining invalid would have never happened. Uh, uh, one. And the most important is Maria Uribe, who is our costume shop manager extraordinaire and who's able to keep this crazy process together. And then, of course, as <clears throat> sorry, Frederica mentioned, it um, sets to go, built the set. And then we had an amazing prop master, Dylan, yeah. Dylan Nelson. Yeah. who gathered all those endless, endless hundreds of little jars and larger jars and filled them with stuff that looks very realistic. And, and just and, for, for, <laughs> con for context, you know, the, this yeah. play, The Imaginary I I Invalid, Argon, is, um, is a character who has all these imagined Ill illnesses. So he essentially collects anything that comes out of his body for the purpose of, of examination. And so I think once we counted and there were mm -hmm. anywhere between 200 and 100, 300 yeah. jars on stage with various specimens and all of them tagged. So yeah. we, we searched, we had, uh, you know, oh, yeah. staff, uh, crew, uh, audience members donating jars. Um, it was really quite an extraordinary project for, for the prop master. The, the other thing that I want to say about Angela's designs that I have always just so admired and loved is that it's not just about the clothes. They're, her characters already have a personality and there's such movement in her renderings. And I, I don't think I've ever quite uh, met a costume designer that uh, sketched in the way that uh, she does. It's they're, they're really these incredible works, uh, works of art. In fact, I have a whole wall dedicated to her in my home. I, I think they're just so, so absolutely beautiful. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Robert, would you talk a little bit about your process? Sure. Um, starts with the script, usually weeks before the first rehearsal, probably weeks before it's been cast. You read the script, and if, if I'm lucky, I hear music when I'm reading it and can kind of get an idea of what we're looking at. Um, first question is always, what period are we in? Are we modern? Are we... If we're Shakespeare, are we sticking to that period that it was written for? Um, and then I just start to act on what I hopefully hear in my head, put it out there and see if we can put together a top of show idea. And uh, if that's successful, then that is what we usually play at the first read through. And then we just, I just start writing from there, try to stay ahead as much as possible. If there's songs in the show, I can usually work on those and have those in hand well before the first rehearsal. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors there. Is there a theme that I want to get out there that's going to be reused throughout the play? Is that part of top of show? Is the top of show going to resolve to underscore? Is there a prologue that the actors are going to talk? I think the longest thing that we've done yet is Henry V with the, the music started well before we went to black. Then there was a choral section. Then there was a prologue, then there was another choral section, then there was a very raucous transition into scene one. So that was the longest uninterrupted music we've done yet at top of show. And the shortest was Imaginary Invalid, where you've got 10 seconds of harpsichord followed by three minutes of a guy sitting in a chair breaking wind. <laughs> in complete silence. Uh, I know. Uh, we, we, we talked a lot about farts in that production. <laughs> yes, we did. My, I have every email from every show we've ever done. And it's, I was reading through them to kind of prep for this and it was astonishing how many times that came up. So that's my process is just, uh, once I read the script, set a palette, is it orchestral? Is there a featured instrument? Like for Henry, there was cello. For Tartuffe, it was French cafe music and guitars and pipe organs. Um, you know, I just try to figure that out and then once the director and I come to an agreement about what the show sounds like, off we go. 
Is there something, is there a particular piece that comes to mind that you think, um, you know, because music, you know, it sets the tone for the play and often can, you know, a amplify a moment in a production or it, it really is it, so critical to, to the world of a particular scene. Is there something that comes to mind for you where, that you felt was really special in terms of the world of, of a play? Um, yeah, I'm gonna go back to Pericles, which was our first play together. So this would have been 2013. And uh, the scene, there were a few in there where I really thought, oh, this is really cool. This is this is working. This, this really is good. But uh, Ephesus, where Marina, I can't quite remember why she's dead, but she's dead. And she's floating around in the ocean and she washes up on the shores of Ephesus and they bring her back to life. So there is music for that that I think kind of and, encapsulates. And as I recall that, I mean, that is a play that there's a lot of traveling and you visit a, each, a, each location uh, that palette. you visit has, has a different palette and a, a, you know, a different feeling to it. Mm -hmm. And this world was very specific. As I recall, it was a very, a very spiritual environment with martial arts influence. Yeah. And we were yes. trying to, it was something that, that we were making up and we were yeah. trying to figure out what is it? And I remember yeah. that when I heard uh, the music that you had for it, it all, it all makes sense. Um, yeah. You yeah. wouldn't happen to have that one there with I, you, would I you? I might. There's, um, I should tell you I had, before we, before we listen to it, I should set it up a little bit. Um, Ephesus, the palette was temple bells, and um, they're going to try to bring Marina back to life. So they're doing a kind of a circular dance and chant thing and breathing. And every one of those, those breaths was a sound cue, a called sound cue. And you'll hear, I think, one or two of those in this. And this is a very condensed version of what was a seven minute scene. I think we're going to get it here. In and so she she's washes up there. She's presumed yeah. dead oh. and she's brought back to life. I don't remember who did her in. I think it was Dionysa. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she washes up on the beach and they do a ritual and they bring her back to life. So when they start to get down to the business of the ritual, we hear a harp pattern and an Eastern flute. And then that evolves into high strings. And then when Marina does come back to life, we hear a harp and low strings come in, which is kind of a punctuation. Then we go back to the harp pattern. And this is an example. I, I explain this to people that do film composing. You have to keep, when you're writing for theater, you have to keep things flexible because an actor is gonna get from point A to point B at a different time every night. So you can't rely on them always fitting your music. You have to write it so that it can be layers so that each layer can be called in whenever is appropriate in the scene. And this is an example of how I think that works.
Wow, that that was that is so beautiful. That was Absolutely fun beautiful. Yes. Wow, brings back great memories. Yeah, we should do it again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, we um, used every inch of the theater for that production. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. were so many actors in back of the audience running yeah. around the bombs and, and, and yeah. back of the seats. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, we're talking about process. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you might speak a little bit to how you approach a realistic place versus something that is lives in, you know, the world of extended realism or fantasy or app, you know, or is more abstract when you're thinking about, for instance, Ken, when you're thinking about lights, how do you how do you look at that? Is, is well, there it's a much difference? More, a big difference. It's much more fun to light an abstract type of show than a realistic show. Um, take a, uh, um, come back Little Sheba, which had a very realistic set. And I would say, um, you know, I'm more preoccupied with lighting, like making the, the set walls look as realistic as possible. Um, providing as much front lighting and coverage all, all over the stage. Your source, your light sources are usually coming from windows or a practical, like a lamp, table lamp or a hanging lamp. And I obsess, I obsess over the front lighting of a realistic set because when I'm watching previews or run throughs, and if I see an actor pass through, you know, maybe just a, a tiny dark area, like, you know, I, I get really frustrated it's a little more forgiving when you are designing lights for an abstract looking um, show because a with an abstract play uh, time doesn't really matter it doesn't you know it doesn't matter like if it's nighttime or daytime you're not even concerned about um, the source of the light in fact the lighting fixtures become the source and um, and then you can kind of pick and choose how you want to like the set, you know, you, you kind of, I feel like I'm sculpting the set on a abs with an abstract play more than I am in a, of a realistic play. Um, with a, a realistic play, your colors are not really saturated. Um, they're more in the pale range. Whereas with a, um, an abstract show, you have high colors, you know, you want the colors to be really vibrant. Um, because the lighting for an abstract play is very presentational. And, you know, especially on a stage like at A Noise Within, we have this thrust stage, which is so three-dimensional. I mean, I don't know how like, lighting a show on a, a, with just a traditional proscenium stage is kind of flat and boring to me. But, um, you know, with, with our stage at A Noise Within, with the thrust stage, you know, the actors are so much like they're so right there in front of the audience and they become, you know, they're part of the set as well. What about Ken? You've designed, uh, you know, uh, our musicals for us in terms of lighting. Is there a different in terms of how you think about lighting for a musical? Well, especially with um, when you're creating light cues, you're usually creating a lot of internal light cues with, uh, you know, with the different songs. Um, again, your, your, the cues are much more bold, much, you know, much more specific um, because you have a lot more of um, movement on the stage. I mean, uh, take like, um, let's say when, one season we did both um, Julius Caesar and Three Penny Opera. And it was really with the same, we, we did them in rep. So that means the lighting plot was for the most part the same. I mean, I mean, during the season, we're not doing, you know, we usually are presenting three plays, usually three plays at the same time, but it's just one light plot. And um, in each light and, and for each show will have its own special, you know, particular specials, but it's still an overall light, a rep light plot for the whole season. But, um, Julius Caesar, you know, had a very cold look, whereas you can see with Three Penny, it's much more vibrant. Um, there's a lot of much more harsh lighting. 
um, and and a lot more patterns with um, Three Penny Opera. Uh, Julius Caesar just had a very cold look to it. So, um, yeah. Uh, and it's, 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 it, I was going to say that it's all, it's always interesting when we have, um, we, we, we obviously always have the rep, but every now and then we call it our little sort of, um, our super rep where we, we purposefully design a set that works for two shows. So it's like, you know, you design the perfect black dress and then you accessorize it differently. And, you know, that's always interesting. And as you say, you know, with those two shows, the, the, the quality of light was so different. So it was really interesting to, um, to hear you talk, talk about those, those, those two productions that, that yeah. wrapped. We did that with King Lear and Man of La Mancha as well. Um, two yeah, that's different right. Totally different looks, you know, from each other, but um, but for the most part, the same rep lighting plot. Right. Angela, will you talk a little bit about that from from a costume perspective? How do you think about like you know, like say a bear? You talked about how much you love Alice, like a buried child mm -hmm. versus an Alice in Wonderland. Um. For a, a realistic play, I'm trying to to um, dress the the uh, character as authentically as possible, and that obviously, or at times, all involves a lot of distressing. Um, um, it I, I'm preoccupied more for a for a realistic play. I'm more preoccupied with the details. And the almost like a cinematic piece, you I feel the need to go into the uh, minute details of the costume and make it feel lived and make it not feel like a costume, but rather like a clothing piece, something that that particular character had in his wardrobe rather than, oh, here is the costume for the concept for this show. Uh, probably one example is the image that you have right now on screen, which um, involved a lot of distressing. And what's interesting is to see a costume piece um, in real life being distressed. And then once it's on stage, it becomes, uh, it literally, you don't, you don't see the the distressing anymore it's it's quite remarkable what can sliding does to make the <laughs> distressing disappear so it's a lot of uh, it's it's a lot of work a lot of layers of uh, distressing that needs to be done in order to make it look yeah, and yeah, I and I the the image that we're looking at right yeah. now, I think I think about it because you know it seems like oh okay that's just that's just a dirty shirt. I think that yeah. actually distressing and having distressing look realistic is mm -hmm. one of the hardest things to it do. Is. And and you're so skilled at that. And I'm always fascinated at the process where one night we're seeing one layer of things and the next layer comes in. And with this particular character of Vince, we mm -hmm. had discussions about how did he fall and where mm -hmm. did he fall? And yeah. so, so, that, so that there was specificity in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the staining on, on that yeah. t-shirt. So it's- yeah. uh, It depends on what time of day, what the dirt looks like in that particular part of the, wherever that story is from so and what's really uh, i will tell this just as an anecdote that uh, while working on films i used to that's very much in the past a long 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 time ago <laughs> uh, i used to distress clothes by running my car over them over <laughs> and over again uh, in my backyard and then distress them. <laughs> yeah i so, love that yeah. Yes, because you had to find a way to do it fast and also make it because it's a film and you are able to see a, a person, uh, an actor very close. I mean, do those close ups. You need something very realistic. So just by painting it with a brush does not work. So that's how 
probably that's why I became better at distressing because I actually I'm trying to do film distressing for theater versus theater distressing. Well, and I also think that coming back to all of you talking about the thrust, the thrust is very demanding mm -hmm. because if you think of a proscenium stage with a costume, you're basically seeing the front of, of, of a costume a lot more than you're seeing the back of it. So mm -hmm. in our space, if the shoes aren't right, if there's a zipper that doesn't look quite no, right, yeah. we, we see we see everything. everything yeah. Yeah. And I think it's the same when we talk, you know, scenically when when we when we look at it. So so the thrust stage is is incredibly uh, demanding of uh, of of the designers. Uh, Angela, you you had briefly talked about Alice. We were talking about Barry Child versus like an Alice, and I saw uh, that Sam put up a great rendering. Um, can you talk just a little bit about that? How you approach that versus uh, Barry Child? Well, obviously, it's a very different approach. <laughs> um, yes, it's uh, if if working on a, a realistic play, it's all about uh, control in a way. Uh, when I get to to design a play like Alice, I can let my hair down and just uh, be go all the way. Just be uh, use as much of my imagination as I can and. Uh, 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 no restraints, no period restraints, everything, in a sense, everything goes with a, a play like this. It's all about color. I love to use colors for, make them vibrant and uh, um, use a lot of texture. Uh, and so it's a different way of telling a story. I think it's more visual, more visceral in a way to do a fantasy as far as I'm concerned, because I mm -hmm. think it's, it's, uh, it speaks almost like to a child. I, I approach it from, I'm trying to approach it from the eyes of a child. Mm -hmm. uh, there is something about these big blocks of colors and the saturated colors that uh, uh, speak to us and, and let us sort of breathe free and, and just enjoy the moment rather than be in our heads and intellectual about the story. So that's what I'm trying to create and how to approach uh, a play like Alice in Wonderland. Although, it, yeah. It, yeah, and and of course I have to also mention the fact that although these are completely, I mean, they're much wilder than um, other productions, but I'm still, the the base, the, the, the starting point for these costumes was, um, uh, uh, or the Keneal uh, illustrations, believe it or not. Yeah, so. beautiful. Oh, I have a, there's a question from a, um, a viewer and Jennifer wants to know, were any of you ever surprised once you saw the whole thing put together with lights, costumes and full set? And was it a good surprise or a bad <laughs> surprise? <laughs> I usually am surprised for most of them because it's kind of hard to visualize what it's going to look like. Honestly, for me, once once they're wearing the costumes, that's when it becomes alive for me. Like when we're teching and people are just wearing their street clothes and the sets usually have paint or whatever, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, plus we're moving, like when we're teching, we're moving pretty slow. It's hard to see how everything is put together until we have a dressed tech run through where we try to, you know, stop. I mean, we try to go and not stop. And then they're wearing the costumes at the same time. For me, that's when I start, that's when I discovered what the play is really looking like. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, I think that there's a lot of excitement. I know a lot of directors dislike tech rehearsals and I, love them because you begin to see sort of the play coming to life uh you know in term in terms of design because you've been in a rehearsal room for so long and once you get in there and you start seeing that i i think it's always a very exciting time especially when sometimes what what you had in mind it is it exceeds your expectations when you get to that moment when everything when everything is put together but i, I always find that to be sort of an exciting birth that happens in, in during tech rehearsals uh, go ahead uh, i just want to say i just want to say real quick that yeah i mean i love previews and 
a lot of times I'll we'll get to opening night and then I'll I'll think, oh, I should have done I should have made this cue, but you know. Anyway, I like to put Ange <laughs> Angela. Yeah, I, I wanted to remind people, uh, we all worked on Tartif, so I just wanted to use it as a reminder of how how uh, wonderfully, for instance, the, the, the tulle skirts ended up being a set and props and how they yes, took right. over the entire, the entire set and uh, the entire world. It became a world about, about net and about not... Uh, sliding on it and i don't know if there is a photograph with uh the when the uh, the the net skirts the two skirts are on the floor and uh, there's a really lovely scene that that's very true i had forgotten about that and yeah. sometimes you discover something like that during a tech rehearsal exactly. because you the costumes yeah. And and it re and the character and things change and uh, mm -hmm. there were so many wonderful uh, moments in Tartuffe with people getting you know the the daughter oh, getting yeah. stuck in all the tool and things that the actors found once they had the costumes. Yeah. Well, you guys, this has been a fantastic conversation. We we could go on forever, but I I think we're we're at time now and. The, all of you have collaborated on on so many productions that I thought um, a, a fun way to end would be to share the Henry V trailer since all of you had your uh, your hand in it uh, that we'd share that with uh, the folks that are tuning in. So so thank you for being here today. Today, thank you for sharing your artistry uh, with a noise within. Um, Jeff and I love you guys and. Uh, are so happy you're part of uh, of the Annoys Within family. And hopefully we will all be together uh, soon uh, mm -hmm. in, in the same space uh, doing what we do. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> happy Friday, everyone. Stay mm -hmm. safe. And here's the Henry V trailer. <laughs> <laughs>